This will be the people news. All right, this video is without recourse, or without prejudice, and or without recourse. All right, I'm not waiving none of my rights. I'm not attorney. I am not giving legal advice. Everything I'm saying or doing, or anything said or done on this video, is not such thing. It's a learning video, y'all. Take it as such. All right, there may be opinions, but it's still learning. Um, never, never, never. Look just straightforward. Always look around you to be able to protect yourself by any means necessary. Alright. I explained this a couple times before, so let's go ahead and proceed forward. What is positive law? Positive law is a federal statute title that has been enacted by Congress. Who has the ability to create law in the United States of America? Congress, ladies and gentlemen. So when the judiciary placates that they can create case law, understand this, they were never granted that authority by we the people. Furthermore, the Congress didn't have the authority to grant the judiciary the ability to create law. The court has no authority whatsoever to create a doctrine saying they have qualified immunity. Period. So what do they do? They mimic it. Make it look as though it's law, but in all actuality, it's just an opinion. Okay? It's not to say that case precedent, for which they call case law, doesn't hold value. Okay? There are many of case sites that I have adopted throughout the years that I utilize that help me prevail by understanding that freedom isn't free and privacy, okay, is one of the most basic fundamental rights. Privacy, the right to be left the fuck alone, okay, so long as you're not causing harm, loss, or damage to another man, woman, or child, all right? Positive law is legal evidence of law and is admissible in all courts, clean across the board. This is what you're going to learn in class, okay? You're going to learn how to enforce positive law, which they are bound by. Remember, those who create the law are more stringently bound by the law, and they should be bound by what they create. There are only 27 federal statutes enacted by Congress that serve as legal evidence of law. That's right, 27 of them, ladies and gentlemen, and are admissible in all courts. State courts, federal courts, lower municipality courts, superior courts, Supreme Court, you name it, they're applicable, all right, and admissible. So when we go through the class, we're going to go through all these positive law titles. What does Title 28 say about oaths and affirmations? That's what we're going to cover in class. Title 28, oaths and affirmations, why they're so important, all right? And this class is going to be held on Saturday, July 23rd, 2022, at 1 p.m. Central Time. You're not going to want to miss this because we're talking about remedies. I'm tired of bitching about the problem and people projecting what the solution is. I'm going to show you the remedy, how you can enforce this, and what you can do if they ignore it. We're going to be talking about one of the disclaimers that I use, okay, because I strongly feel that notice and opportunity, due process of law must be had, that we have to come in with clean hands, pure intent, clean heart, um, for the right causes and the right purpose, and that purpose is to ensure that nobody else trifles on not only my rights, but your rights. If they are encroaching upon your rights, they're indirectly encroaching upon mine, and I won't stand for it for a fucking minute. There's been enough of that shit over the last 225 years to last us for a, a, a century easily, okay? And, or for the rest of time, for further that matter. What is non-positive law? Non-positive law titles are prima facie evidence of law. It means they have the resemblance of law, but they're not law at all, all right? So that's where we have color of law, color of authority, um, you know, things of that nature. And we'll get deeper into that in the class. Um, color of office is another one. And then we're going to get into what's funny is 
the 27 non-positive laws. Just a moment ago, I told you there were 28 positive laws enacted by Congress, and then there, equally and oppositely, are 27 non-positive laws, all right? So there's always a balance. There's a yin and a yang. The important part is you have a choice. You have a choice what you allow in your life. So this class is like preventative maintenance, if you will. We don't change the oil in the motor after it's blown. That's just ridiculous and redundant. We change it beforehand. Preventative maintenance. We don't fill up a tire that the sidewall's already been blown out of with air because by that time it's already too late. The rim has already done its damage on the rubber and caused it to blow out the sidewall. So there's no need to stop at a gas station and try and fill it full of air when the sidewall's missing. We put air in it before it gets to that point. So what we're going to be teaching you in class is how to exercise preventative caution, mitigate your risk, and also how to enforce your rights. The tides are turning, ladies and gentlemen. Don't miss out on an opportunity to accelerate your learning at a phenomenal rate due to my miscalculations and errors and mistakes that I've made in the past that have cost me dearly, okay? Time is something that you never get back. Once it's gone, it's gone, and I've lost out on time with my friends, family, um, and, and experiences in life because I've been in a cage. And it was all because I didn't take the time to learn this beforehand. This is stuff that should all be taught in the curriculums in school. All right, and that's another issue for another day, but it's something that we as Americans need to think about. How is it that we score the most piss poor standards around the world as far as education? And, and mark my words, we absolutely do, okay? Why isn't the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, something that is taught to you every day, day in and day out through grade school, middle school, high school, college? It's not. Many of the armed forces members that I talk to, retired, um, veteran, whatever you want, active duty, all tell me they don't have any courses on the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, anything like that. They don't, they're not subjected to it. Why? Because they want them to be obedient and they want them to do exactly what they're commanded to do. All right. Many officers, many uh, officers in the military have told me, Derek, you can't disobey a direct order. The fuck if you can. If that order is immoral, if that order is about firing on American people, that's domestic terrorism by your government. That's mixed war against the American people by your government and engaged in mixed war against the Constitution, violating their oath of office, and they should immediately be strung up from a fucking tree and swung. That ain't no bullshit. What are annotated codes? People tell me often, Derek, hey, I look at the case sites, the case precedents that you speak of, and that language isn't in there verbatim. We're going to talk about that because there's the annotated code. There's the uh, annotations of the conclusions that are drawn from the case. There are slip notes that are often discovered or published on the Internet or in books. You actually have to go into the law library to get these slip opinions and, and slip notes. Okay, so some of the stuff that I post, people go, well, I looked on the Internet. It doesn't say that. I have lawyers do that to me all the time. Not surprising, but go into the law library and open a fucking book. It's not rocket science. It's there. All right. <clears throat> Annotated codes are state or federal complication compilations of statutes. All right. An annotated code is one stop shop for researching the intent and purpose of said statute and how it applies constitutionally. All right, remember, the Constitution is a law of land, baby. The only higher law than the Constitution is God's law, natural law. What goes up must come down. You don't have to like that fact, but that fact will always remain a fact, no matter how ignorant you are. What goes up comes down, all right? What are the elements of a warrant or a verifiable warrant, and how do we verify the warrant? This is going to be covered in class. Lawful judges, okay, we're going to go into their bonds, what they're required to do, what oaths are applicable, what different oaths mean, 
Certain oaths are for commerce. Other oaths are for the du jour republic form of government filling the actual seat. We're going to talk about what is Title IV US, uh, USC subsection 101, okay, that oath. We're going to talk about the Title 28 oath. We're going to talk about the Title V oath. We're also going to talk about this. The Title IV oath that he's talking about is the Article VI, Title IV, Section 101. This is what I've been talking about to y'all for a couple of years now. It's good to see that he brought this up because it is a very important oath. A constitutional oath, okay? Uh, what evidence, uh, what evidence is the need for an oath? We're going to go into some Supreme Court case sites. We're also going to delve into the Constitution and show you why they have to have these oaths. And by law, if they don't have these oaths, then they're in breach and they have no authority, no duty to obey, no duty to enforce. If you aren't really feeling the seat of office, you can kiss our ass and you better quit pretending to be an agent of the United States government because you're an impersonator, you're an imposter, and you can be cast into Guantanamo Bay for that bullshit, all right? This isn't fallacy, ladies and gentlemen. The people throughout the world are waking up to what's really happening, all right? What is an oath to state constitutions? Again, I told you earlier, we're going to cover that. I'm going to load you up with so much knowledge in this class that throughout the next six months, eight months, 14 months, whatever it takes, slowly you will start to understand what I'm telling you. And you will start to see the ramifications of having this knowledge, how beneficial it will be to your friends, your family, and your community. We don't change Washington, D.C. by storming Washington, D.C. It'll never work. But I will tell you what will work when we stop participating. Derek, how do you do that? It's quite simple. You see, there's a W-4 V form out there, and I believe it's box number seven. And you just simply check box number seven saying, I no longer wish to voluntarily participate in artifice and scheme and check it off and hand it back to your employer. That's one way of doing it. You're not going to be holding federal income tax anymore. You're not going to be withholding it. I'm done participating in your scheme and I'm done having the blood of other children from other nations on my fucking hands. Oh, my Aberdeen should be in prison. Hillary Clinton should be in prison. Barack Obama should be in prison. Eric Holder should be in prison. I, I mean, those are just a few off the top of my head. I could literally go for weeks about all these people that should be in prison right now for their egregious crimes against humanity, egregious crimes against uh, children, uh, human trafficking, executive order violation 13903, 13.818. I mean, I could just go on and on and on. And that's just from the top of my head. Imagine when I get in the books and I really apply 200 to 300 hours of research and study and put it all down on paper, the list would be extravagant, all right? What else are we going to cover in class? Bonds for judges, all right? What is a bond? Where is the bond? How's it held? Who's the surety? Who's the principal? Who carries the primary active degree of fault when a claim is made? We're going to go into that stuff. You're not going to want to miss class. I'm telling you that right now. Requirements for surety bonds. What are the general requirements of a public official's bond? All right. And there's a number of them out there. There's a good faith bond. There's a surety bond. There's a fidelity bond. There's the criminal policies and procedures bond. All right. So there's more than just one out there. A lot of people just talk about bond and they use bond. The word bond is a blanket to cover everything. All right. But uh, when you really start to look at it, <clears throat> there's more to it than that. And the law is specific. I had, a, had an alleged judge, okay, magistrate, whatever you want to call him. I kind of respect him. He's, uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain. My relationship with this guy is a little weird. Uh, but nevertheless, in hindsight, after leaving the court, after being in front of him, I'm always plagued with questions that lead to hindsight going, oh my gosh, he told me exactly what to do. But in the courtroom, I was filled with rage and anger because, uh, well, that's
that's what they're trained to do. They're trained to get you off your game by getting you to be hostile. Because when you when your blood starts boiling, you don't think the same. You're not so tactical about your maneuvers. It's a game of chess, ladies and gentlemen. And you can claim checkmate every day of the week on these people because they don't know the law or they do know the law and they're intentionally violating it just to provide you a remedy. All right, listen. That's another thing, y'all. When you go into court and do this, you need to have fun. You've got to play the game and you've got to play chess and check mate them. What I just told you. These people either one know the law and are openly violating the law, or two, they don't know the law. Alright? If they know the law and they're violating the law, they're intentionally committing a felony to give you a way out. That's hard for people to understand. They will break the law to give you a way out. What are the two common types of public official bonds? We're going to go through that. Who needs a public official bond? We're going to go through all the people that are required to be bonded. All right? Many people have a misconception that just because somebody's in the clerk of the court's uh, office that they're bonded, that they're a public official. That's not always true. All right? There are a lot of civil servants out there. There are a lot of people that are private that work in the public sector that don't have oaths of office and aren't bound by an oath of office. All right? We're going to talk about de facto defined. We're going to talk about the end. I have not once came across an oath of office as the Article 6, Title 4, Section 101. As far as I'm aware of at this damn point in time, there is no evidence of any government officials actually filling that out. Anti-bribery statements. How many people of you even know what an anti-bribery statement is and that it is a requirement of a judge to have one? How about that? Hmm? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about enforcement through time. That would be section 27. 18, subsection 201. We're going to cover Foreign Agent Registration Act. Now people say, oh, it's not there. It doesn't exist anymore. I'm telling you it does. I'm telling you that I know with firsthand perfected knowledge that it's enforceable. All right? What All right. We're going to pause it there, finish it off on the next video, y'all. I mean, uh, take it as it is. All right? Um... If you want any more information, I made a video of his uh, video, mirror video, uh, a few videos back. Okay? This will be the People News. Bye.